Talk Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Collins, along with my friends, Emily and Christy. The whole purpose of our talk show is to demonstrate that life goes on and healing happens as long as you keep moving forward. Especially our context is about um, coming out of a group that is co- considered a high control group. And our topic this week is about modesty. But before we dive into our topic, I wanted to talk, read a listener question. And if you tune in and stay with us till the end, we will try to answer the question sent in by the listener. So paraphrasing, the listener says that um, at age five, she and her parents um, became part of a secret Seven Thunders movement, which is part of William Branham's following um, in Connecticut. But in 2005, um, this lady chose to leave because the leaders wouldn't let her daughter attend local community college. And her mama bear woke up inside of her and she realized there was nothing wrong with higher education. Um, and sh- they were trying to use Romans 13 to try to get her to just obey them based on taking that scripture out of context. And um, they said to do what they said because they said so. And they didn't kick her out of the church, but they shunned her. Um, and they wanted her to recant and take her daughter out of the local community college. But what she decided to do is leave and go to another church in our high demand group, the message of William Branham, but it was not so strict. Um, It was very difficult for her to leave that Seven Thunders movement. It actually caused what she terms a mental breakdown. Um, But then in 2013, after reading online at Believe the Sign and other websites that the message was incorrect, she left the message for good. And it was so much easier than leaving the Seven Thunders movement in 2005. So her question is, does that make sense? And Christy and I both have different thoughts about that, that we will give you at the end of our show. So um, our topic today is modesty, and uh, maybe we'll add a little sub subcategory, modesty and sex, because um, I've read a book called The Great Sex Rescue, and I found it to be very informative, and um, I th- would recommend it to readers if you are interested in n- thinking about sex from a different perspective and not um, the way that you grew up thinking or the what you had been taught in the message. So uh, the first topics we were going to say, think about when we address modesty was what we thought when we were in the message and then where we are now. And then finally, the pressure on women not to tempt men. And then I thought it would be fun to do a word association activity to kind of help us think of different ideas that we had related to this topic. So what you thought then I'm going to pick on Emily. When you were in part of your high control group, could you describe what you thought about modesty in those days? Modesty is what you wear and how you present yourself. Don't have makeup, don't have earrings, have long hair, have a long dress, don't wear too revealing of a top, make sure it's not too low cut, make sure it's not too tight. Some of those girls that got those jeans and filled in a little piece of fabric and those little tight skinny jean skirts, uh, that was definitely not something that I thought was modest, even though it was, uh, you know, long enough and stuff. So it was a lot, it was, it was all the outward appearances. Um, you know, it was just, how did they look? How could you flash judge them by a glance across the room? That sounds very similar to, um, my thinking when I was part of the high demand group, I prided myself on my modesty, even though I'm sure there were people who thought I wasn't as modest as they were. And isn't that interesting that I'm saying I was proud of being modest, which is sort of, (laughs) this should should be sort of an, well, the opposite of one another. (laughs) I'm not going to try to say the word that goes with it because I'll butcher it. But (laughs) the antithesis of being modest would be being proud. And here I'm being proud of being modest. So, Christy, how about your thoughts? What you what you thought when you were a part of your high control group um, about modesty? So, for me, um, part of the message's appeal was the wholesomeness and that that whole image of like um, we live holy lives and we don't have you know some of the like problems of abuse and 
and uh, sexualization that happens out in the world. So for me, entering the high control group, modesty was about protecting myself uh, from physical and spiritual harm. Um, it was a bunch of rules and like things that you definitely shouldn't do that um, there was there was things that were modest in terms of like long dresses, having long hair, um, wearing things that were plainer, not quite so like fancy and like frivolous in nature. Um, so for me, that's more or less what modesty was. Um, it wasn't so much about not drawing attention to myself because in the message you, you do take kind of a, there's kind of like this weird balance between like, we want to be the light of the earth, you know, like we want, we want people to notice that we're dressing counterculture. Um, but it's also like, I want them to have the right kind of attention on me. Like I want them to see me and think, Oh, she's so holy, you know? Um, so modesty was about like how you present yourself to the world, presenting yourself in a particular light, not so much, you know, what the actual meaning of the word is. <laughs> Sure. Speaking of the actual meaning of the word, I've actually seen on Facebook, not before I left my high control group, but more recently, um, women saying modest is hottest. So to me, again, <laughs> like, you're trying to be hot. Is that, you know, I mean, how does that go with modesty? So, um, yeah, I think we sometimes we um, run circles around ourselves with our words, <laughs> trying to make what we're doing make sense. Um, when, what I thought then, okay, I said I was sort of proud of my modesty. Um, I would never have worn a sleeveless top, never in a million years, unless I was swimming with only women. I would not have dreamed of wearing a sleeveless top, although there were plenty of people I knew who did, but I would not because, you know, I was so much better than they were. <laughs> <laughs> How embarrassing, but, um, you know, and, uh, I, i you know, my skirts, I was in no danger of showing my knees. You know, there, I remember having, um, people in my family, parents ask me to raise my arms as if I were praising the Lord in church and make them, they would check them to make sure that the very bottom of my knee did not show in that sort of a situation. Or like if I were picking apples or um, anything I might do with raising my hands above my head, it wasn't to pull my skirt up to where you could see the bottom edge of my knees. I remember being told from the time I was two years old, cover your knees, cover your knees, cover your knees, cover your knees. Um, yeah. It, it puts um, a lot of pressure on girls, whether we're talking about making men lust after them or not. Just the whole idea of it's your job to be modest. Um, I remember um, sticking my tongue out at guys if I thought they were looking at me um, and, and appreciating my beauty because they shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> and um, that's just... Uh, I, I, I get cringe, you know, there's so much cringe when I, when I look back, but I, I remember a day that, um, I went to a park and, um, I had on a skirt. It wasn't, it wasn't a thin skirt. Um, and I hadn't worn a slip, an undergarment, a slip. And I said, Oh, the, the wind is kind of chilly. I wish that I had worn a slip. And one of the sisters I was with said, Oh, I remember those days. I used to be rebellious. Now I wear a slip all the time, even under my jean skirts. And I was floored. I was so floored. I, I did not know that it was a competition and we were supposed to wear slips under our jean skirts to be extra holy. But apparently, yes, that was what I was supposed to be doing. And then you sound like the group out in Utah that has their holy underwear. So, you know, <laughs> there are those. That's another high control group, isn't it? It has it nothing is. to do with William Branham. But yes. And if you happen to be part of the high control group who uses holy underwear or you've left that group, feel free to uh, tag along on our journey and uh, give us your comments and tell us how you identify with what we're saying. Um, we'd love to hear from you as well. This is definitely not a Branham only fest over here. We're interested in hearing all kinds of people's thoughts and ideas. So, um, I don't know where, what I thought then. Oh, I remember um, buying a swimsuit, extremely expensive swimsuit. I think I paid probably $100 for it. Um, you could buy a $100 swimsuit that's typical 
for anyone, but this, this modesty swimsuit, it, it was, you know, it was just basically a short sleeve top with a V-neck made out of um, kind of stretch, stretchy, easy dry fabric. And then it had a skirt, an easy dry skirt. And under that were leggings that came down past the knee. And that, I really kind of felt like a Muslim in that. Um, and I, it was to me, as far as not drawing attention to yourself, it was the opposite because it drew all kinds of attention. You know, you walk into a swimming pool, the dress like that, everybody kind of looks like, Ooh, who is she? And what does she believe that makes her wear something that looks like that? So, but, uh, let's move away from what we thought then, unless either of you has thoughts that have come to you while we've been going over this, that just, Oh yeah, I remember that. Okay, so we will move into where you are now. And um, I'm going to start with Christy this time since we started with Emily the last time. And Christy, you want to talk about modesty, your thoughts about modesty now? Sure. So to me, modesty is not about like the external impression we make on other people anymore. Um, It has nothing to do with that. It's about my heart and my intentions. Um, It's about not being showy and boisterous and like trying to present my wealth and like one up other people with my appearance or like how I present myself. Um, but it's not just my, how I present myself. It's, it's my physical body, my, the other possessions that I have. It's basically, um, it's basically an effort that we make to not place ourselves on a pedestal above others. Um, and to keep ourselves grounded and recognize that we're all in this together, that, we are not superior to other people for anything like that. Um, it also means not going to excesses to the detriment of myself to give an image. So for me in my personal life, it means I don't, I don't like buy super expensive clothing or like bags or stuff like that. And that's just a preference that I have because, um, I don't know. I just, I would prefer to, to keep my presentation to other people non, competitive in nature and non, um, like flaunty. Um, I like to have nice things. I I buy nice things so I can take care of them and use them for a long time. Not so that I can have like this image that I'm conveying to the world, um, which I think is the main difference there. And, um, yeah. So to, to use a very like, like Christianese word, um, I think, I think modesty and idolatry go together. Um, a lot of times we take our possessions and our person and we make them into idols and we say, this is like the most important thing to me and and everything else has to be secondary. And like, I'll go into debt to try and present this image to the world. And to me, that's like the, uh, the epitome of immodest behavior and immodest like conduct. Those are great thoughts. How about you, Emily? What are your thoughts recently about modesty? I'm kind of right along the same lines as Christy when she was talking about kind of what's your intentions and what's your heart. There's actually a scripture on that first Samuel 16, 7, saying that the Lord looks at the heart um, and not the outward appearance that man looks at. And just thinking about myself having lived other places with other cultures and just barely scratched the surface um, of what other cultures see modest and immodest. Modest, you know, thinking about uh, showing our knees or or not showing uh, our arms or whatever. Where I lived with a semi-nomadic uh, tribe of cattle keepers, it's really hot there. So you could go into the village and see completely naked men and see women uh, completely topless. But... Do not show your thigh because that was super, super sexual. The, the thighs were all it. So you could be in church and there's women with their breasts out all over the place, feeding a kid or not, um, but no no thighs being shown. Or um, you daren't go, um, one of the um, cultures in the area, don't go outside of your house with your hair still wet or looking like you just showered because that indicated you just had sexual relations and nobody wants to know about that outside of your house. So don't go outside with wet hair. (laughs) So it's just kind of interesting thinking about the differences. So, you know, where am I at? What am I doing? Uh, You know, we talked in one episode the first time I went uh, swimming without my swim shorts on and just in a one piece swimsuit. Now it's just kind of like, you know what? Not out there flaunting it. And 
you know, a guy, if he's looking at you to lust after you, that's his problem. I'm not out there sitting and trying to be all sexy and whatever. Um, and I'm looking no different at the beach than someone else. So I'll wear a tank top. I'll wear shorts. You know, I'm not going to wear super, super shorts uh, with my pockets hanging out below the bottom of my hemline because I'm just not comfortable doing that. That's not my my deal. But, uh, you know, showy things when I was living overseas, I love dressing. I found that like I was always in drab colors and all this like I love super bright colors and it's so much fun. Like I have, you know, a pink shirt that's like five times brighter than this. And then I have a great pair of these kind of green teal shorts that are just like totally pop. And that's fun, you know, so (laughs) definitely not high control group standards. But again, walk in, if you have old me when I was 16 walking into a store and current me walking into a store, who's going to get the stares going and the attention uh, drawn to them? New me or old me? Definitely old me would have had attention drawn. And it was just kind of like what you're saying, Jennifer, taking pride in being modest, but modesty... You know, we're sitting here talking about clothing, but really modesty has minimal to do with clothing, if you ask me. It's definitely what's what's your intention and what's in your heart. You know, go over to Finland and uh, go there during sauna time and you're going to be sitting around with a whole bunch of naked people that don't care because they're just there sitting in the sauna and that's part of their culture. And it's not highly sexualized like it is here in the U S and I think, uh, The Puritan culture brought a lot of that in. There's a lot of other history. And if you look at the time period that our high control group that all three of us came out of, kind of what they were fighting and the culture and why the older people were fighting what they were fighting and so focused on the dress and, you know, all of these things. Um, It's fascinating. And then my my thing when I was young, I found a verse, um, 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 10, talking about not having braided hair and not wearing gold and not wearing pearls and all these things. And I'm like, that's half the people in the church had braided hairs. and, And how many of you watching now would have a gold wedding band on? You know, according to that, you're not supposed to do... to to wear those things or have the braided hair, you know, think about the sisters that had their hair braided and it would go down to the back of their knee and how blessed they were. Um, But then, you know, we want to talk sometime about and and get some guests on uh, for the women of color within the message and how much pressure that put on them, you know, Uh, these modesty standards being all about the looks put so much pressure on um so yeah i'm not where i was at before and you know i think we've christie's talked about it uh when you come out it's not like ah i have attained exactly what i want to be it's okay to ebb and flow and kind of keep keep growing and moving uh as you and and developing as you age and as you mature and as you get different places in life and have different friend groups yeah, just be be free a little bit. Don't go wild. I see some people that leave their high control group and really kind of go super, super the opposite way. But whatever, you know, they're finding their way. That wouldn't be my choice. But uh, yeah, just have some freedom, I guess. So I love both of both of your thoughts. And, and Emily, it's always so fascinating to me when you talk about your life overseas. I think that must have been so surreal to you having grown up on a farm in Wisconsin and in a as a homeschooled teenager and then as part of a high control group and then leaving that to become a Christian and become a missionary and go overseas to Africa. That's just wow, that's just amazing. But um, as far as where I am now, I you you guys both covered it so well. Um, I 
I'm with you. I don't want to spend a lot of money on my um, my appearance. I do go to a consignment shop and that fits along with something else that I'm a little bit passionate about and that's the environment. So um, I like to go to a consignment shop where my friend has a curated collection and um, I can, you know, I can get a pair of blue jeans for 12 or $15 instead of 30 to whatever they are. <laughs> and um, so I, I do a lot of that. And um, to me, that's modesty. And um, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to all the trends, but I'm also not the reverse of that. Like, I know people who think, oh, I would never wear a pair of jeans with those rips in them because those are trendy and that wouldn't be modest because that's like trendy. And so I wouldn't I wouldn't be like that. It might not be my preference to have a, a pair of jeans that has those rips in it. But if I had a daughter who wanted to wear those, I would not be telling her that's not modest to do that because it's, <laughs> an, it's a trend. You know, um, I kind of like what Emily said about all her colors and um, I, I tend to be a little bit flamboyant, but I try not to be so flamboyant that is over the top. I think probably over the top um, is is what I, I try to avoid in pretty much all areas. <laughs> you know, if it's over the top, I'm going to kind of shy away from it just because it's over the top, you know. <laughs> so um, this kind of a serious topic that we wanted to address now is the pressure of women not to tempt men um, and, uh, there's a, a book that I read called the great sex rescue. Um, and, um, just a second. Okay. Do you have that? Gregoire. Gregoire. Okay. So the great sex rescue is written by Sheila Gregoire. And, um, it's part of sort of the deconstruction literature that's out right now where people are trying to look at their faith and bring it down to its parts and see which parts make sense according to their the Bible or whatever their standards are and which parts they just need to throw away. And um, one thing that has happened in purity culture is that um, women are kind of taught that they shouldn't like sex, um, that they that they're they are tempting to men if they dress a certain way. And that um, that even makes sex less fun, believe it or not, in the long run. Um, there are there is even um, a disease called vaginismus, which causes um, sexual intercourse to be painful for women. And a lot of that is based in some of the things they have been taught about it. And they're so they they have psychological reactions. And um, this great sex rescue book is um, based on research that has been done. Um, and one of the things I, one of the takeaways I had from it is a woman who, um, sits in, um, a congregation or is in a part of a group where some of these things are taught, even if they don't believe them, it can still have a detrimental effect on their relationship with their husbands. And that's the super serious thing to me because I mean, goodness, I believe now, I didn't believe when I was growing up, but I believe now that God um, created sex and that he gave it to human beings for pleasure. And so um, anything that, that would um, cause that to be um, less than it should be, I feel like that's something that's tearing down something God created. So that's, that's a serious, serious thing for me. But anyways, um, pressure of women not to tempt men. I know that was a big part of my life. I remember my first full-time job after moving to Indiana. I was working at a Dairy Queen and I was um, a manager. I was the only girl who wore skirts. And uh, I remember that there was a whole row of elderly men who came to drink their coffee. And I remember a few people saying, you know, that um, maybe one of the reasons they came and sat where they came, where they came and sat, where they sat there was because I was there to look at, you know, to be eye can candy. Um, and I did have one of them tell me I should go work at Hooters because I could make a whole lot more money than I did at Dairy Queen. <laughs> so, but... I'm thankful that those kinds of comments and those kinds of conversations were not frequent because if they had been, it would have really made it difficult for me to do my job at the Dairy Queen without being self-conscious, without um, feeling like what I did um, through no fault of my own was, you know, causing a man to sin, which I 
think a lot of women go through that and young girls, they go through that feeling that, um, that because of them, you know, someone else is, um, falling into temptation. And I think there's a lot of other problems that come from that. Um, you get girls who don't want to be girls anymore because it's so hard to be a girl. You know, they're embarrassed by the parts of their body that they feel like are, um, are beautiful, you know, that are attractive to men and they don't, they feel like that's a bad thing. So then, you know, they, they don't, they don't, that they shy away from that. So those are my thoughts and they're a little disjointed, but (laughs) Emily, would you like to speak to any of that about the pressure of women to not tempt men? Maybe you were lucky enough to leave your high control group before you had too much of that. Well, just sitting here listening to you talk about that made me think of what I what I said when you were asking about um, where I was at in my high control group and, you know, thinking that even the girl that would take the blue jeans and modify them into a long jean skirt, you know, was being super immodest. So here I am. Man, there's some great pictures of me. I should find the one where I'm in this, like, pastel-colored plaid skirt with a red men's t-shirt and men's black and white striped tube socks and, like, purple tennies. I was out digging a pond in the garden. I'm just, like, this most ridiculous, awkward-looking kid, right? But I didn't care. But then thinking about it, when I was 12 years old, having the... 26 year old worship pastor or I guess they don't what do they call them in in the high control group song leader song leader there you go (laughs) (laughs) having the song leader lust after me and saying oh I hear wedding bells ringing in our future I get all tight and tingly and pointing to his groin when he's around me or you know sitting on the couch with me and touching me inappropriately and we'll have to put a trigger warning on this video but I want to put it out there because here I am I am underage, I am dressed appropriately, and I'm being lusted after. So is it on me or is it on the 26-year-old who can't get his stuff together? So, I, th- you know, how many women have dealt with this within their high control group and because of where they're at, they're not part of the original creation, they're, you know, beauty is of the devil, all of this stuff. So yeah, how does it affect them in their sexual relationship with their husband? They don't feel, you know, worthy, they don't feel sexy, they don't feel whatever, and so how does that in the long run affect them? So did I get away unscathed with that even though I was young? I would say no, because, you know, they're adults it's on them so to to have that pressure it's like it's really like being in an alcoholic um codependent relationship here you are trying to control and do the best you can to kind of avoid the rage of the alcoholic to avoid the lust of the man no it's not on you That's not on you. That's a very, very unhealthy situation. It's on the other adult in the situation to control themselves and to work on themselves. So that's that was that was my thoughts when I was sitting here listening to you talking about that going. No, I was all of the things that shouldn't been lusted after. And yet I was, you know, so explain that, Mr. High Control Group Pastor. Yeah. I agree 100%. I um I heard of a young woman um part in part of the same high control group that I was um at age 13 was told that um she had like a lustful spirit or something. 13-year-old girls do not have lustful spirits. The brother, quote unquote, in the church who's having problems with lust, he's the one with the lustful spirit if there is such a thing. It's not the 13-year-old little girl. No, she just wants to be cute and pretty. She's not trying to attract any of the men in the church. You know, she might like to have a little 14-year-old boy think she's cute and talk to her, maybe even hold her hand, but she's certainly not thinking about lust. 
How about you, Christy? I know you weren't raised um, in this high control group. Thank the Lord for that. I'm so happy for you (laughs) being able to have a childhood. Um, But I know also that um, these high control groups and especially the message of William Branham doesn't really have a corner on purity culture. And I know that's out there. That is out there um, in evangelical Christianity. Um, and that's why Sheila Gregoire can write this book and, and sell lots of copies because a lot of people grew up similar ways in different churches. Right. Yeah, I was, I actually had a similar experience. Um, so when I was, I, I was first sexualized by an adult at church, um, when I was, I was 12 years old in the Methodist church and, um, I, I don't know exactly how old he was. Like, you know, your, your ability to judge the age of another adult is kind of skewed when you're 12. Um, so I don't know, but, um, he said something like, uh, he said, uh, call me when you're 18 years old so I can take you out to dinner. And I was like 12 years old. Um, it was super weird. And all the adults around thought it was funny. Like, I don't, it was just like such a strange thing. They thought it was harmless, but that was like, why would he have said that to me? Why, why would anybody say that to any child? Like now as a mother, I have a 13 year old daughter. If somebody said that to my child, like that would be fighting words, right? Like I would not be okay with someone insinuating that about my child. Like there's nothing about me at 12 years old that would be appealing to an adult beyond just perversion and physical lust. Like I, I was a child in every way, like mentally and everything else. So to put that on a child, um, then coming into the message, I think, um, you know, that kind of gets internalized that, that that's how men are and that we just have to accept that that's how men are. Um, coming into the message and seeing sort of like the, the, perceptive, the perception of holiness surrounding it was really attractive to me. Um, like Emily said, we'll probably need to put a trigger warning on this episode, but, um, another thing that happened to me when I was in high school, I was physically and then kind of like emotionally, um, a, like, uh, harassed by a, a boy in my class and it had like a sexual undertone to it. Um, and it wasn't long after that, that I started changing the way I dressed. Um, and yeah, the, my impression of how to conduct myself and the reason for modesty was, was formed and clouded by my previous experiences and like the base understanding of society that says men are incapable of controlling themselves. And it's up to us to ensure our safety, number one and their moral rightness before God, like it's our responsibility. Um, I don't, I don't think we've said it yet, but one of the doctrines in the message, the high control group we came out of was that if a man looks at you and lusts after you, then you have committed adultery with him already in his heart. Like you not, you're not, you don't have to think about it, but if he looks at you and, and has the thoughts you're doing that in his heart. So you're guilty and culpable for it, which is just nuts. Um, how can I be responsible for something that happens in his mind? But that's the way we were taught. That's, that's, that's what the doctrine is. That's why modesty is so important in our, was so important in our high control group. Um, because we do have culpability. There is a moral imperative to this without doing it we could go to hell. Like it's that important of a thing because it can result in sin. Even if we do not physically sin or even know knowingly sin, we can unknowingly sin, which is crazy. Um, <clears throat> so I would say, um, the biggest thing to me, I, I read the book that, that you're talking about Jennifer, the great sex rescue. And one of the things that she, um, talks about in there is like the first time women and girls are sexualized is so young and it's so telling in society. And if you took a poll of like a hundred girl or like a hundred women, they would probably all say it was like prepubescent or close to pubescent, which is just disgusting. Um, and I wish that we had a really good answer to purity culture that says this is how we undo it. Um, but it's not that easy. I think the biggest and most important thing we can do 
for ourselves and for other people is to divorce the idea of modesty and moral rightness and divorce the idea of modesty and sexual purity because those things are not, they're not intricately woven together. Just because you dress a certain way does not mean that you've acted sexually impure or you intend to act sexually impure. It's just a choice you're making. And it's not a moral imperative for you to dress a certain way because you're not responsible for someone else's thoughts and how you per are perceived by other people out in the world. And I want to say again, really wise words, <laughs> really wise words, Christy. I find myself saying that a lot when you speak <laughs> really wise words. Um, one thing I want to go ahead and um, talk about here is um, the idea of the objectification of women. And um, a good way to define that is just thinking of women as an object instead of as a person. Now, I know that one of the um, famous pastors in the movement that we grew up in, um, we talked about something that he got from someone else in purity culture about how um, a certain part of the man's brain lights up um, around women who dress immodestly. It's like the same part of the brain that lights up when he thinks about um, a hammer or a power tool or something like that. Basically, he's putting the onus on the woman again. He's saying, you are making yourself into an object. But I would say that that teaching makes women into an object. When you put a person you take a person and you say that um, they are basically the sum parts, the sum of their parts, their body parts, and you don't think of them as a human soul, as someone God created, as someone um, to love with filial love, someone to see as a sister, you know, or a mother, um, someone else's family. Um, but you see her as body parts, then um, you are the one making her into an object. And if you are a pastor who is teaching people to, teaching men to bounce their eyes off of women and not engage, rather, it's more important to make eye contact. Look at the person's soul. Don't be just looking at their body. They're not a temptation for you. They're another person. Engage with them the way Jesus would engage with them. Engage th with them with compassion. Engage with them with love. You know, Jesus had a woman of ill repute washing his feet and anointing him and wiping his feet with her hair. And we know that Jesus did not sin. Therefore, he's engaging with this woman. And I would, um, I would challenge men to do the same. Engage with the women that you meet. See them as people. Don't see them as objects. I find it very disconcerting when I come across a man um, and he won't look me in the eyes. It really bothers me a whole lot. Um, it makes me feel not valued. Um, it makes me feel marginalized. Um, it makes me feel like he sees me as an object. And it happens to me you know, fairly often. Um, and it's not because I dress immodestly. It's just because that's the way some men are taught to interact with women. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I wanted to put that out there as well. So if anyone else, if you all have any comments about um, women being seen as objects or objectification, feel free to chime in with those. Yeah, I think it's also really damaging to men to tell them, that they don't have control over something that they do have control over, that they can take control over if they are struggling with it, um, exempting them from blame and saying that if you see a woman and you lust after, like in the message, if, if a woman was causing you to lust after her, that was a her problem, right? She was seen as disdainful and distasteful. And you were seen as just a normal dude. You can't help yourself having these lustful thoughts for this random person, even, even, young person, even a young, you know, minor child, um, that you look after and you lust after them, you're in the right. Cause you're a man, you're red blooded. That's how God made you. I think that's really damaging to men. Um, so I, I think it, it keeps them from developing fully into who they could be. Um, they don't develop the self-control that they could, they don't develop the mental fortitude that they could to overcome whatever shortcomings that they have. Um, so yeah, we need to, we need to hold them accountable and, uh, and encourage them to do better and to be better and not coddle them. 
Um, don't not put it all on the women and say, you know, you guys, it's okay. You, you just kind of suck at this and you, that's just you. Um, and women will fix it for you. No, I think that this is something that I, you know, I hope one day I have sons that they are gentlemen and that they, that they do look at women and they see them as, uh, as equal and capable people. And, um, yeah, I, I really hope that my daughters are seen that way. I, uh, yeah, I don't think that it's our job as women to protect men from their own weaknesses. And I think we do them a disservice, um, within purity culture by teaching young men that that's women's job to do for them. I would also like to throw this caveat out there. Um, as a sister of brothers and a wife of a man, I know that young men growing up in purity culture, they get the idea that when they're physically aroused, that's lust. That is not the biblical definition of lust. The biblical definition of lust is kind of right up there with, um, what is the word when you want something that doesn't belong to you? It's one of the 10 commandments. One of the 10, what did you say? Coveting, right, right. So lust, really, you're making a plan to get this woman, right? And you could say that um, playing things out in your um, in your imagination, that's a similar sort of thing, right? Making a mental plan, that mental, the mental mental blueprint for what you would like to do with this woman, a similar thing, lust. But just a physical arousal, that's not lust. That's just your body reacting. You know, just like if you walk past the, if you smell bread baking and you walk past the bakery and you, your mouth waters, that doesn't mean you're, you're coveting that bread just means you might be hungry. (laughs) Right. And, um, there's, you know, a lot of sexually hungry young men and, um, physical arousal is not lust. You don't have to answer to God and repent when you experience physical arousal. You can, you know, nod to yourself and go, yep, that was a beautiful lady, you know, and that's okay. God made you to react in that way, just like he made your tongue to make saliva when you um, smell bread. So, um, Emily, did you have anything you wanted to add to the conversation about objectifying women or any of that? Oh, man, there's so much. How do I capture it all? My ADD is going nuts right now, and I got (laughs) to kind of reel it all in and make it a little bit more succinct here. But like, you know, talking about uh, the pastor with the screwdriver, you know, women are just a tool. You know, I actually had a note uh, when I was preparing for today going over kind of our, our notes I wrote down, uh, you know, it's what's modesty. It's not pride and it's not arrogance. And I happened to have driven past that pastor's house in Tennessee and saw his Cadillac Escalade sitting out front, his multi-story brick house, his mansion and all this stuff and seeing the suits he wears. And, you know, where's his heart at? I don't know, but his Cadillac Escalade kind of makes you wonder being this poor humble, you know, high control group pastor or thinking about my own pastor growing up, got a brand new car every other year and was so proud of it. You know, in it, that in itself, is it bad? No, but when you're setting yourself up in this position to be such a humble person, you know, to even think about the founder of our high control group. And if you actually look at the pictures throughout the years, all his shiny brand new cars that he had throughout the years and all his hunting trips, and you add up all those trophies of those animals that he got, um, that's a pretty penny. You know, is he modest in his way of life as this humble pastor? That's a great question. Um, And my ADD brain has lost all the other things I want. Oh, yes, men lusting. And I really like what you said, Jennifer, about like, oh, the arousal. Oh, man, you know, I need to go into the back room and flog myself now. I think that purity culture has accentuated the problem. And, you know, why do men hide their porn uh Challenges because we've created a culture where you can't talk about it openly and 
you know, they, they, they're they forced to hide it because they're a human and they've got their psychological dopamine, all these uh, things associated with, with this drug of choice. Um, and I think it's terrible that we have created a culture, even in modern mainstream churches where they don't, a lot of them don't want to talk about it. Is that the boomers? Is that the age? I don't know, but I think open up the conversation and you'll see a whole lot more freedom in men and women and uh, in the high control groups. I know I mentioned this before when I was reading through my Bible uh, in the process of leaving Colossians 2 just totally, totally popped out to me. I'm like, this is what we did. This is what we were. Since you died with Christ to the elemental force, spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules are these rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based merely on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So again, it's you know, now we're talking about not just the clothing that we wear, but it's how we have these do's and do nots and these rules, but it actually hasn't reached our heart and where our heart is in it. You know, if I was in another um, culture where a nude beach was acceptable, would I go to it? Maybe, you know? It's, it's, I'm not going to sit there and be lusting after people because I know where I'm at and, um, I know where I'm at and, uh, whatever. I mean, I, I'm sure I'll get blasted in the comment section for that, but my, my pastor's wife, one of my pastor's wives in my journey of Christendom grew up in one of these European cu countries, um, came to the States for her university and then married an American man and was talking about like having to talk to her boys when they would go back over to visit their grandparents, you know, her parents and going, okay, we're going to go to the beach. You're going to see these things this is why it's culturally different than where we're at and it's okay thinking about i mean veterinary medicine is completely different it's dealing with animals but you deal with animals all day and i'd have to do um semen collections from dogs to artificially inseminate another you know like bulldogs can't do it naturally sometimes or if you were worried about disease you get it from the stud you'd put it in the female you do this stuff and you think about doctors like bits are bits and parts are parts i kind of laugh that when you go to the doctor like you know to go get your annual exam they got to put this little gown on you and then they put you on the table and then they're still looking at all your bits anyway and i'm like why are we wasting our time and energy with the gown you know i'm just my body and you're not sexualizing me so um yeah modesty purity cultural that stuff kind of winds me up a little bit because i have come so <laughs> far <laughs> and going we're making it worse by talking about it all the time you know i remember watching movies and like, oh my goodness they just said that they just did that like i think people within the high control group are like so hyper sexualized that it's like it's super disturbing or by not or by not talking about it, right? I mean, I remember being, I was old enough to read before I knew the name of one of my body parts, you know? And it was a couple of kids who were also part of the high control group who told me what sex was, you know? And they said, you know, the boy does this, you know, or the man does this and to the woman's this. And I'm like, I don't have one of those. They're like, oh yeah, you do. <laughs> I had no idea, did not know the name of my own body part. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot to be said for candor and being um, 
scientifically correct in the way that you talk about bodies. It takes, it demystifies things and makes them less forbidden. Forbidden things are sometimes alluring, you know, and if we just be matter of fact, you know, use common sense. But I do want to throw out a, a, a resource here. This is something that was very helpful to me when I first left my high control group. There was not a whole lot out there um, in the cyberspace or whatever, but there was um, a lady had started a group. Um, her website was spiritualabuse.org. And there is a Facebook um, site for spiritualabuse.org. And then there is also... Um, there's also a group that goes with that called spiritual abuse recovery dash Christian koinonia. Now koinonia, I believe is community or fellowship. One of those words, it's a Greek word and that's spelled K O I N O N I A. And we will try to put links to those Facebook groups in, um, our description, but anyway, um, I think we're at the point where we can uh, do some word association. I thought that might be kind of fun. You can answer with a word. You can answer with a phrase. You can answer with a sentence or a, a story if you have one. So what do you think of when you hear bikini? <laughs> Christy. Um, I think of going to the beach and all the appropriate things that you would do to wear a bikini. Sure. Emily. Yeah, someday I hope to have the body to wear a bikini because I think it would be much more freeing swimming in a bikini than even a one-piece bathing suit. So there you go. Right. And um, I remember that I was shocked when I found out there were certain bikinis that were supposed to be more modest than other bikinis. And like they color cover up the belly button or whatever. And so I'm not <laughs> all about that, but I did... Uh, go to Florida on spring break and there was a young girl there I think she was probably eighth grade or ninth grade and she was wearing a bikini and it was one of those that had a little bit more of a brief rather than a little um string for for the 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 and I just thought she looks so pretty you know she really looked pretty and I thought you know what she's modest and she's wearing a bikini <laughs> you know um when uh, after we left our hiking trail group and we were part of the one of the local Baptist churches um, they had a youth group activity and it was, um, I think Bethany Hamilton is, um, she's a famous surfer and she put out, um, uh, was it called soul surfer? Is that the name of her? Soul surfer was a movie about her. Yeah. Right. So they were going to watch soul surfer. And this was my oldest son's first experience with the youth group. He was um, going into sixth grade. I was freaking out. I was, you know, less than a year out of my high control group. <laughs> And uh, so, but, you know, I got past that freaking out. You know, I didn't say anything to anyone. I was just internally freaking out. I didn't even say anything to him about it. But I just thought, oh, my goodness, beaches and bikinis and girls and movies. And this is this is what the youth group's going to be about. And but I knew that these were godly people that I was going to church with. And so I knew it had to be OK. So I just did some research, you know, and pretty soon I realized, you know what, this is I'm untangling this web that has been woven around me for so many years. And uh, so I'm really glad that they did that. And I remember um, the youth pastor saying, you know, maybe that wasn't the best choice. <laughs> But um, yeah, they 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 that church went a little bit more conservative um, after that, and um, we didn't wind up staying. But um, anyway, it was another one of those purity culture meets deconstruction things that didn't go real well. <laughs> but anyway, so that was bikini. All right, so um, we've talked a lot about modest. Any last words? Modest. What do you think of when you hear the word modest? I kind of think of um, appropriateness. So appropriate for the occasion, uh, appropriate for what you're doing. Um, so if you're going to, if you're going to a ball, you wear a ball gown, right? Um, it might not be modest to wear a ball gown to the grocery store. Like you're going to get attention for doing so. Right. Um, but when you're going to a ball, that's what you wear. And when you go to the beach, you wear a bikini. Um, so to me, modest is, is synonymous with appropriateness now. Some other things I think about with modest are like humble or like unassuming. Um, and I think, Christy, you hit those pretty hard earlier. <laughs> what about you, Emily? Do you have any more words about modest associations? No, I think I've kind of sat on my pedestal and <laughs> my soapbox and shared quite a bit about what I think about modesty. And, you know, honestly, 
It's it's like a number of years ago when I was um, spending the summer with some friends who had just come out of the high control group after 31 years. And the question was always like, oh, is this appropriate? Is this modest? Is this pleasing to God? Should I do this? Is it okay to have a little whiskey with my Coke? Is it? And, you know, modesty, I think when I think about it now, I don't, I don't think about it that much because I just am appropriate in the situations and I don't sit and dwell on it. And when's the last time I thought about modesty in such terms other than preparing for this time together? It's probably been quite a while. It's not something I sit and dwell on. It's just, I'm living life. I'm being appropriate. And I don't really give it a time of day, which is quite fascinating because <laughs> before it used to like consume you. <laughs> As a parent to a, a daughter, um, my my thoughts on modesty with her, I have to revisit it a lot more often than I think the other two of you do because you don't have daughters. Um, but there's this like there's like this uh, tendency in me I can tell to like air on the side of her being more covered. Um, and that goes back to my own trauma, right? That goes back to like my own life experiences. So I've really had to work hard to overcome my own obstacles. So I don't give her any hangups about it. And yeah, I just really try to focus on the appropriateness of, of our dress and, and, and our presentation to the world with her. Um, like even with the, like wearing a bikini, you know, I, I had a hard time putting on a bikini the first time, you know, like coming out of a high control group. I I didn't, you know, obviously we didn't wear bikinis then. It took me many years to get there. But ultimately what did it for me was like, I want my daughter to have body confidence and self-confidence. And she's not going to do that if I don't do that for myself. And so um, it became very important to me to like, if I'm going to the beach, I'm going to dress appropriately for the beach. Like I'm going to wear a swimsuit and yes, I'm going to wear a bikini on occasion. Okay. Our next word in our word association game is jeans. <laughs> what do you think when you think about jeans? They're super comfy and I'm super tall. So they're always a pain to find that ones that are long enough. <laughs> But, you know, jeans, yeah, oh my goodness, life is so much better in jeans and thinking about even the creepy 26-year-old when I was a little girl, if I would have been roaming around on the couch with him laying there looking at my skirt, it would have been a whole lot more modest for me to be wearing jeans and being fully covered in that situation. So, you know, I'm kind of pro-jeans for sure. (laughs) Yeah, I'm too. Um, One of my first experiences with modesty and realizing that skirts are not always modest was um, in a gymnasium with toddlers on a play date. And um, all the other moms were wearing either jeans or longer shorts. And I had on my skirt still because I hadn't made the leap. And I was trying to tug it on my skirt and trying to chase my toddler. And it was not nearly as modest as they were. So, yeah, blue jeans for me are comfortable, casual, um, yeah, and, and pretty, they last a long time too. <laughs> so they're a good buy. <laughs> How about you, Christy? So right now I really miss jeans because I'm pregnant and I can't fit any of the jeans that I own. Um, so I look forward to getting back into them. And uh, in Florida, I have to be like particular about my jeans because I get really hot. <laughs> so you have to choose the ones that like, I don't know, you can wear when it's 100 degrees outside. And jeans are constantly a fight between me and my 13-year-old daughter because she likes the ones, like Jennifer says, that aren't really her thing, that are, like, mostly torn up holes. And, like, yeah, she likes the jeans that look like they've been absolutely destroyed and dragged by a truck. Um, And it drives me insane. I'm like, why are we buying these? (laughs) Are we spending money on these when, like, I could do this to a good pair of jeans after you've worn them for a while if you want. My niece also likes those jeans and she says, but you can't make them look like this because they have those little tatters across, you know, they're really pretty fancy. They're just fancy in a different way. (laughs) Yeah. So, all right. We are actually almost all out of time. So I think we need to go back and um, talk to our listener who sent in the question. Um, I will give my answer because it's very brief and then I will let Christy give her thoughts because she went deeper with her thoughts than I did. So we had a lady who had left um, the Secret Seven Thunders movement 
um, in 2005 because the leaders wouldn't let her daughter attend the local community college. She had gone to a regular message church that wasn't so strict and that wasn't in the Seven Thunders movement, but that was extremely difficult for her. She had been shunned, um, but she refused to recant, so she needed to move churches, And but that was so difficult for her. But then in 2013, um, she found a lot of things online that showed that the um, high control group she was a part of, the message of William Branham, was false. And she found um, that she could actually move all the way out of the high control group. And she said that was a whole lot easier. And she asked if that made sense. Now, my easy answer, my quick easy answer is yes, that makes a lot of sense. Because when you have um, so much documentation out there showing that what you have been raised in is false, it makes the mental part of leaving a whole lot easier. Um, if you have a desire to leave, you can absolutely find every reason in the world to leave. Um, you can reason your way through it. You can see in the Bible where it's wrong. And um, that makes it easy to leave. Once you see that it's wrong, it's almost hard to stay. At least that was my experience. But Christy also had another thought about it. And I loved her thoughts. So I wanted her to share her thoughts as well. Yeah. So when I read the, this person's uh, message to us, one of my first uh, thoughts was, wow, what a controlling group that she was in in the beginning for her, like the Seven Thunders, like secret group that she was a part of. Um, I think that probably contributed also to the difficulty in leaving the first kind of go around when she left that particular sect of the message. Um, because when it's more controlling, like you have to break a lot more mental bonds and a lot more physical bonds um, than when you leave the group at large. Um, just because when it is that controlling, so much of your life is tied to it um, and it has to like all come unraveled. And I think I also probably contributed that she, she did that one time and then doing it another time. It's just, well, now I get to unravel just a little bit more. Um, so I think both of those contributed to it. And I agree. Um, Emily, do you have any words for our listener? Yeah, I think it's great. All the resources that are out there. I left in 2001 and there was like one resource available online that was specific to my high control group. So my first kind of uh, getting on the internet, you know, a, a cue little dial up tone here. Um, that's the kind of internet I was getting on back then. It wasn't just floating through the house and Wi-Fi like it is now. I had to go to the neighbors or go to the library and we didn't have internet at our house. Um, <clears throat> but searching, there was actually a, um, I'm going to use the C word. There was a cult an, uh, a cult survivor group out of Australia that was run by a Jan. I forget her last name. Sorry, with a G. Um, but I was there was there was something from my childhood um, that my uncle had said when we were over at my grandparents watching the news uh, when Waco was happening and. He used the word, well, we're not a cult, so that's why I went and searched cult and found this. And I'm like, oh, man, this really kind of hits home. But at that time, John Kenna was the only one that had this forum. And so I would kind of look around on there. So I think it's really, really helpful. And that's why I think all three of us are willing to lend our voice, even though uh, there will be negative comments and s much to the chagrin of uh, some of our family, I'm sure, uh, and former friends. But I think it's great that there's these resources and I challenge people if you have the desire to do more research, if you have the desire to be part of a support group, if you have the desire to even, uh, you know, if you're at such a point in your journey to come on here uh, as a guest or have a question or have a thought, maybe a topic that you think we should talk about, I we welcome it because it's great, the resources that are out there now. So I do think it's easier because like Jen said, it helps that kind of psychological bit that you can go on and just see this overwhelming um, encyclopedia and, and library of, of information going, yep, that was wrong. That was wrong. This is well documented. Here's the newspaper articles. You know, I still remember when, uh, 
what was the name uh, of the website searching for vindication when when that couple um, who live in Minnesota came out with all the stuff about the bridge and all the research and dug into the historical records, even down to the Coast Guard's uh, daily log and what they ate and what time sunrise and sunset was. Um, I think it's great. I think there's the Internet uh, is <laughs> it's ironic. You think about uh you know, TV is so bad, and that'll probably be another thing we talk about sometime, but how terrible TV was, but it was our high control group just didn't talk about the internet, so internet is free game, and you talk about all the high control group people on the internet, uh, and now now the pastors are trying to control that, so it's quite a, quite a fascinating time we live in, and it's great to see because, yeah, there's support groups and all of this now to help people kind of get out and it's not just like okay here I am I'm a woman I'm a nothing I have no education I must be the only person on earth that's ever had these doubts and this is terrifying so you know you're not alone now right you know you're not alone and uh, let's put that in the description as well links to believe the sign and to searching for vindication and um, anything like that that might be helpful So thank you all for listening. We hope you found the show informative and helpful. Feel free to contact us at movingforwardtalkshow.com if you have any questions or any ideas for future shows. We look forward to hearing from you, and we will continue to go on demonstrating that life goes on and healing happens as long as you keep moving forward. (music) 